Well, it's great to have you on live stream tonight. Uh, it's a nice snowy uh, Sunday evening. And we're going to be looking in Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'm going to share a message entitled, By What Power? By What Power? Out of Acts chapter 4. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1. But while you're opening your Bible up there, remember uh, this Wednesday evening Bible study will be live stream only. And then this next Sunday... Uh, will be 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. live stream only. And so make sure you put that down on your calendar. And uh, we don't want you to miss out on anything. Uh, we certainly want to continue studying the Word of God together, uh, be willing to pray for each other. And uh, we have uh, several people that are still uh, battling with COVID. And, and uh, some are in the hospital, some are home. And uh, we need to... Uh, really just lift them up before the Lord. Uh, we need the power of God uh, to do something miraculous in their life and certainly within our personal lives and our life and our ministry of our church. And so by what power? Acts chapter 4 in verse 1 says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, uh, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that the, the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, a high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred, kindred of the high priest, uh, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them um, uh, in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if uh, we this day be examined of the good deed done in this uh, to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, and be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now uh, this is the stone which was set at the naught, at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Uh, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And behold, the man which was healed standing with them uh, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? Uh, for that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them, and it is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no farther among the people, let us straightly threaten them uh, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they came to them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all the men glorified God for that which was done. Uh, for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, uh, they went to their own country and reported uh, all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, 
Thou hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. And uh, so let's pray together. Father, thank you so much allowing us, for allowing us to be together tonight by live stream to be able to study the word together. I pray uh, we might consider uh, the power that was available uh, to Peter and John and, and the other disciples and certainly the message that they presented in the name of Christ changed people's lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you may help us to uh, understand how we can uh, gain this great grace and this great power uh, that comes from God Almighty and from God alone. And uh, Lord, we need power for healing. Uh, we need power for salvation. We need power for boldness to live our life uh, in this world. And God, we need uh, you to do something miraculous through us so that God might get the glory. And so I pray that you bless the preaching of the word of God tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our text verse is verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? So what power? Uh, we know that uh, uh, Peter and uh, John uh, had gone up to the temple to worship and to pray at the hour of prayer. And there was this man that was over 40 years old who was paralyzed and was begging alms. And Peter and John would look at him and uh, acknowledge the fact that they, had, they did not have gold or silver to offer him. But what they did have to offer him was a healing power of God to work in his life. And he, he stands up and he walks in the strength and the power of God and is miraculously healed. Well, that created quite a stir among the people uh, because of the fact there's a, about 5,000 men, it says in this chapter, that got saved because of what happened uh, in this man's life. They got saved because of the preaching of the gospel of Christ. And uh, as a result of it, they're stirred up, they're excited about it, uh, but boy, the religious leaders certainly were not excited about it. And uh, whenever, whenever we do something for God and we are watching the hand of God move in a miraculous way, uh, there is always going to be opposition. There's always going to be questions in reference to uh, who you are or by what power did you do this? What authority do you have in order to do that? And uh, they would identify uh, to the crowds uh, that it was through the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that God had walked, worked this great miracle in the life of this man who was lame. And so by what power? Realize that tonight, that uh, God uh, can and he will do something that is very miraculous if we could just believe him for that power. And all the way through the scriptures, we see the, the power of, that is available for believers to be able to testify and to be able to see the hand of God move and God deliver. Uh, you know, I just think of going through the book of Acts. You see, you know, um, Paul and Silas being delivered when they're in the Philippian jail. You see Peter being delivered uh, when he is in jail. And the church is, uh, is making prayer for him and interceding for him and God delivers him and over and over again, all the way through the book of Acts, you see these miraculous events that are taking place, whether it's miraculous healing or whether it's miraculous deliverance or whether it's a miraculous life-changing experience like Paul on the Damascus Road. Uh, it would, all these things that people experienced in Acts were by the power of God. And so these Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of Israel, are questioning they want to know what power did Peter and John have to be able to heal this man uh, and release him from this bondage of his physical infirmities. And may I say that people always want to know by what power are you living? By what power is God moving in your life? And uh, uh, how can you testify of what God is doing? So let's think about this. I tried to line up the verses just so we can kind of go through the scriptures and uh, not be flipping back and forth all the time. But I see, first of all, in verse 8, that there is the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Notice in verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of a good deed done in, to, to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? And so, first of all, there is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And certainly, Peter would stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 souls would be saved. Uh, he would, uh, would proclaim the power of God through the fullness of the Holy Spirit to those who were questioning how could this man who has been a, 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 a lame for 40 years uh, be healed so quickly and so completely. Well, it was Paul, uh, Peter standing up in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Mark recognized the necessity of the power of the Holy Spirit back in Mark chapter 1. If you want to turn over there, you can. We're going to try to look at a few verses and kind of work our way through the scriptures and considering uh, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit. Mark chapter 1 and verse 7 says, And preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And certainly John was aware of the fact that Jesus, as he would come on the scene, uh, fulfilling uh, the, the prophecies of the Messiah that would be born, uh, that he would fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament in filling them with the Holy Spirit of God. And how we need the power of the Spirit of God in our life uh, to be able to deal with the issues in life. We, we're living in a strange world, and, and I'll tell you, there, there seems to be no rhyme or reason uh, in dealing with the issues in life right now. And so how desperately we need the fullness of the Spirit of God upon us if we want to be able to see miraculous things take place as it did in the life of uh, uh, Peter and John and certainly uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, we must have the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. So John recognized the necessity and the experience that we would have of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But also Jesus had promised that there would be power when the Holy Spirit would come. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And uh, I think sometimes we uh, ignore or downplay the significance of the fact that we need the power of the Holy Spirit in 2021. Uh, we have got to have the Spirit of God resting upon us and, able, and to enable us to deal with the issues of life, whether it be bringing physical healing upon someone or bringing spiritual deliverance in someone's life. Uh, it's going to require of us to experience the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so the power of the Holy Spirit, not only was it recognized by John the Baptist and promised by Jesus, but we see it was experienced in Luke chapter 1 by Zacharias. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 67. And we're just going to be turning to the right a little bit in your Bible so you can follow along very easy. But in Luke chapter 1 and verse 67, it says that his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Now, uh, how desperately we need to be filled with the Spirit of God to be able to prophesy and to reveal the things that God has so stated is going to take place in the future. His father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he hath visited and redeemed his people. And uh, the Spirit of God being upon us, it, it, it gives us the ability to experience a move of God and a revelation of God about what he is going to do for in the future. We're, we're living, I believe, in the last days. I believe that we're living in a time frame uh, where uh, more and more Bible prophecy is going to be fulfilled in reference to uh, the Antichrist, in reference to a one world government, and in reference to men turning their back on the Lord. And uh, but, So it's going to be necessary for us 
to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we might be able to prophesy about these things that are taking place. I heard a preacher say the other day, I thought it was a very good statement, uh, that you, you need to understand that America, the American church, does not have its freedom of religion because America says we have freedom of religion. The American church has freedom of religion because it is Jesus Christ who said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'm afraid we're living in a time where we think that we must constantly look to the government for approval and affirmation. In reference to who we are, no, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God so that we can prophesy what it is that God's going to do through his people and through his church. And uh, we have to stop the looking to the government as a means of our affirmation. We are affirmed in our faith through who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in our life. And so uh, his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. I just thought about a little statement in his father, Zacharias. Well, it would be nice to have dads in the church that are filled with the Holy Spirit of God. May I challenge you men that are watching tonight, your, your wife and your family, your children need you to be filled with the Spirit of God. And uh, they need to see you walking with the Lord and experiencing a great move and great power that is being released because you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So I see there's Zechariah. I see Peter in our chapter where we already read verse chapter 4 and verse 8 that Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost. And Zechariah experienced the fullness of the Spirit. Peter experienced the fullness of the Spirit. The early believers in Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Notice in Acts 4 and 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And good old-fashioned revival prayer meetings where we get filled with the Holy Spirit of God and our, we are shaken, we are moved, we are stirred, in reference to God doing a great miracle in us and through us. And so if the early believers experienced that in the book of Acts, and certainly I think we can experience it in the church in uh, 2021. I see not only believers, but I see the apostle Paul experience the fullness of the Spirit of God. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 9, Acts chapter 13 and verse 9, uh, then Saul... Uh, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You know, Paul would go out on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13, and he did not have to go far before there was great opposition. And the opposition was so strong and so aggressive that it was constantly hounding their ability to do ministry. And Paul being filled of the Holy Ghost, we have to be careful about this, by what power, the power is by the Holy Spirit. It, the power is not in man's abilities or man's intellect or man's maneuverability. The power comes through the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, Acts chapter 13, in uh, verse 52, we see the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. It says that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. And may I say that a Christian who's filled with the Spirit of God will have the joy of the Lord upon their heart. And uh, I'll tell you, there is nothing more precious than to be able to live our life in a way that testifies of the fact that God is all-powerful and it is God who is working through us. And so when this man was healed, they wanted to know by what power, by what power did this take place? And they confirmed the fact that it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. But also I see that it was by the power that's in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 10 of chapter 4 of Acts, our chapter where we started, 
in verse 10 it says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Jerusalem that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. And so notice that by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Notice the very specific response in verse 10 as they're questioning by what means was this man made whole uh well wait a minute i want you to know and i want all of israel to know i, I like that because they don't just narrow in on those who were questioning them but rather they're responding to the fact that not only they want you to know those who are questioning but all the people of israel that it was by the name notice the specifics Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. In other words, there was so much uh, specific identity in reference to who Christ is, they could not be confused about it being somebody else. Uh, there's only one Christ, there's only one Savior, there's only one Son of God. And uh, he came into this world, and the world received him not, but as many as received him, that then gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so he uh, was buried, and he rose again, and he sent it up on high. And uh, we need to make people understand and help them to know that any power and any miracles that are going to take place are going to be done by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And so the power in the name of Jesus. Notice there's power to heal. In uh, Acts chapter uh, 3, which is only one page over there, Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give, to, I give I thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And uh, it wasn't in some prophet's name. It wasn't in some church leader's name. It was in the name of Jesus Christ that this man could be healed. And so there's power in the name of Jesus. And I, I think sometimes we forget just how powerful the name of Jesus is. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, we see not only is there power in the name of Jesus to heal, but there's power in the name of Jesus to save. Notice in uh, verse 12 of uh, Acts chapter 8, it says, But when they believed Philip's preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Uh, once again, they're not confusing the issue about who Jesus Christ is. And uh, they preached unto them about the kingdom of God. You know, the, the reality is we're not a part of the kingdoms of this world. Uh, we're just pilgrims passing through, and we're a part of the kingdom of God. And because we're a part of the kingdom of God, we have one king who reigns over us, and that's Jesus Christ. And we are baptized in the name of Jesus, both men and women, it says here. And uh, then Simon himself believed also and was baptized i mean there was a change there was a difference there was salvation that was experienced because of the name of jesus christ i want you to know tonight that our identification our association our connection that we have with each other is through jesus christ and christ alone it's not any other religious leader not other religious movement uh, no other religious person throughout history is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And so the power in the name of Jesus to heal, uh, to save, but also the power of the name of Jesus over demons. In Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16 and verse 17, says the same followed Paul and us crying and saying these men are the servants of the most high God uh, which show unto us the way of salvation the statement that he is made, being made here by this demon is not a false statement the problem is it's a statement of ridicule and mockery 
And now uh, in verse 18 it says, And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And so we can stand against the demons of hell because of the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we do not rebuke the devil in our name or in our will or in our desires, but we rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, he has to flee. And so the power of the name of Jesus to heal, to save, to overcome demons, and then the power of the name of Jesus in Philippians 2.10 uh, over everyone. And a man may say, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Uh, I, I can live my life as I please. But the reality is, is every individual is going to have to submit to the name of Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so what, what a day it is going to be when man who mocks God and man who rejects Christ and man who denies the reality of Jesus as a Savior, he's going to have to bend his knee and he is going to have to confess with his mouth and he's going to have to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord why? Because there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, by what power was this man healed? By what power did this experience take place? Well, it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it was also by the power of the name of Christ. Now, back in our chapter, in Acts chapter 4, and verse 20, notice it was by the power of a witness. Notice in verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Uh, that is a powerful statement of being a witness. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And uh, all that we might be able to experience a move of God so that we might have something to testify about. You know, when I got saved, I never got over it. And I'll tell you, God gave me a good dose of salvation, and I've been excited about being a Christian and certainly about God's call in my life uh, to do ministry. And I'm thankful for the grace of God that, uh, that works in me and enables me to do that. But all I can say is this, all my life has been is just speaking for the things which I've seen and heard, the things that God has shown me that he can do uh, when man uh, cannot do it, when, when there's nowhere to turn and no way out, there's a God in heaven uh, who cares enough to intercede for me. And so a witness, the power of a witness. Uh, what type of a witness do you have for God? What type of a testimony do you have to share with the lost? What type of a testimony uh, identifying with Christ do you have that impacts other people? Uh, because of the fact that the change that God has worked in your life, the power of a witness. You know, I thought about the good Samaritan, or I should say the Samaritan woman. In John chapter 4, I love John 4 when we see Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. Uh, but that she had a great testimony. And John chapter 4 and verse 39 says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him, for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. Uh, Jesus Christ's relationship with this woman impacted her, changed her, uh, and, and delivered her uh, from the bondage of her sin. Her immediate response was just to run into the city and testify of that. See, you, you and I have the great privilege <clears throat> of God working a miracle in our life uh, to a point where we have something that we can rejoice in that the world does not know and cannot comprehend. But we, there is power in the testimony of the saving grace of God in our life. And uh, this woman impacted many that were in the city 
because of the fact of what God had done in her life. And so I see the Samaritan woman had a powerful witness. I also see the Apostle Paul had a powerful witness in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18 and verse 4 says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And so let the Spirit of God impress upon your heart to testify of who Christ is. Uh, the answer to the world's problems and the struggles that mankind is having is Jesus Christ. And uh, sometimes I, I feel that people think you're oversimplifying that because of that statement. But the reality is, is all I need is Jesus. All I need is for Christ to be ever-present working in my life. And uh, I, I need a testimony and a witness that, that shows forth the praises of my God. And so we see the Samaritan woman had that witness. The Apostle Paul had that witness. David had that witness. Notice in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 6. Says, but one in one, I'm sorry, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is uh, not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. David certainly testified in Psalm 8 of this great grace that God would extend to all mankind. So much so, when you look and consider everything of all creation, how could God be that mindful of this infinite, or I should say finite, uh, man? And so David. And then I see a power of witness as far as the witness of God. Look over, turn over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 9, the witness of God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 9 says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Oftentimes people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, there, not everybody believes what you're talking about. It doesn't matter if everybody believes what I'm talking about or not. Uh, because if you receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. And he that believeth on the Son hath a witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so the witness of God, a powerful witness of the Samaritan woman who changed and testified of the grace of God and it affected those that were in the city. The testimony of the Apostle Paul that was so strong that literally he would convince the Jews of the fact that Jesus Christ was the Christ and the Son of God. David would testify of the vastness and the power of God Almighty, but yet he is still interested in his creation in mankind. And then the testimony of God is it doesn't matter what man thinks, the testimony of God is more powerful and stronger and life-changing. And then I just put down this, the power of the witness of a believer. 
In third, John, we're in First uh, John chapter five. Just turn over a couple of pages. In third John verse three says, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Uh, what a powerful testimony. What a, a powerful witness that we have when we say the Bible is true. It's without error. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And we believe that, we say that, we testify to that. And yet, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we're still testifying of the same thing. And uh, there is a great witness, a great testimony, uh, when God's people, the believers, uh, walk in truth. No wonder, uh, in our text verse, says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And I, I just really believe that we need to have a life that testifies of God's grace. We need to have a life where people question what's different about you. Uh, how is it that you can overcome these things? How is it in a an air of time where stress and discouragement and depression and everything else is, is overwhelming mankind because of sickness and disease and finances and everything else. How is it that you can still have the peace of God that passes all understanding? People look at that and they're wondering in their mind, what power, what power are you living by? Well, we're living by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And we're living by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And we are living by the witness, the testimony that God has given us to be a powerful witness of the things of God's grace. I want to encourage you tonight with the fact that, wait a minute, you don't have to be distraught and overwhelmed with this life. Uh, because there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in the Holy Spirit of God that will fill us and bless us. And there is a power in your testimony. A power in your witness. I've often said uh, over the years that the greatest thing that you can have is a testimony that is life-changing. A testimony that shows forth the grace and the power of God working in your life. Because people, people will want to know, what is it? By what power do you have this great victory in your life? Uh, well, it's by the Holy Ghost. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's by a witness that is real based on the truth of the word of God. Uh, if you're listening and you're not sure you're saved tonight, I want you to know that you can be saved. And you can call on the name of Jesus and uh, he can save your soul. Neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. There's only one. It's Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful back in 1979 he saved me. And I know this, in 2021 he can save you. And call us or text us or whatever. Just get a hold of us on Facebook. Now, we'd love to testify with you of the grace of God that can save your soul. Believers in Christ. Some of you are struggling. You have family members that are sick. You have different loved ones that are going through some great trials right now. Don't forget, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is power in the Holy Spirit of God. And there is power through your witness and your testimony that you have for Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. I'm thankful, Lord, for the word of God. It's so precious. I'm thankful for Jesus. Uh, that we can know that we're saved and that we're going to heaven. And that our faith in Jesus uh, makes all things possible in our lives. I pray for healing power to be upon those right now that are sick and struggling, many with COVID, uh, many with other things, Lord. Uh, you know the need that is in their life, and we're, we're just praying a prayer of faith, believing that all things are possible to him that believe it. And we're asking you, Lord, in the power of the Spirit of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, you bring healing upon them. And then, Lord, how we just pray that you'd give us uh, great grace 
at this time to be able to tell others about Jesus and how they can be saved. Thank you for this time of Bible study. We love you, Lord, and we appreciate your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen.